I'm going to be talking to David Pickup, who is the Pembina Institute's Electricity Program Manager, about a report that he's written about the Ontario Integrated Energy Plan, and we're talking nuclear, gas, and not maybe as many renewables as one might expect. So welcome to the interview, David. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for having me. I've got a question for you because I interview, I don't know, hundreds of experts around, mainly in Europe and, and United States, a little bit in Asia. And it seems like uh, those uh, regions that had uh, power grids that were dominated by coal, by nuclear, by gas, um, they don't want a lot to do with, with renewables. Uh, they they want to go back to the, keep the grid the way it is. They don't want to invest in storage. They don't want to invest in digital controls and, you know, in uh, grid forming inverters. They don't want to re-engineer their grid uh, in order to incorporate did a wind and solar and batteries, which is the lowest cost way to generate electricity. Is that kind of what we're seeing in Ontario as well? Not necessarily. I mean, I think Ontario is doing a really good job in the in its integrated energy plan by bringing together all of these different threads, um, whether it's the gas network um, or even looking at hydrogen and kind of bringing together electricity along with other energy sources. So they're doing it. The, the, this this uh, um, plan that the government put out uh, is interesting in, in that way. Um, what we're saying in this report is that maybe the balance isn't quite right. And there's this really big bet on nuclear uh, and increasing use of gas over the next few years um, and kind of a deprioritization of renewables over the long term, which, as you've kind of highlighted, a lot of um, you know countries across the world are really going for that lower co lowest cost resource, which is renewables and some of these other um, things like energy storage. Okay, so uh, Terry is, is doing the things I mentioned, but maybe not for the reasons I mentioned them. Is that the argument? Potentially. I mean, the uh, the, the reliance on uh, nuclear, you know, really a, a massive build out, um, we think is a risky bet because it's expensive energy to start with. And it's not quite sure whether it's going to be delivered on time and on budget, even at those higher levels. And so what we're saying is, you know, let's kind of get that true diversity of supply, do other things uh, like energy efficiency and really kind of uh, build a, a grid that's fit for the future. Why do you think it is that they are so fixated on nuclear and gas? Um, and, and I'll have to tell you, uh, some of my take on this has been dictated by interviews I've done over the years with, with other experts from Ontario um, who, you know, have advocated wind and solar and and, and batteries, a, a higher percentage in the grid. And it seems like the province is just dead set against that. Is it a, is it, does it go back to the old um, uh, Green Electricity Act from the, you know, 2008, 2009? Is it the current government? I'm, can you give us a little insight into why they're so reluctant? Sure. I mean, I, I'm not, not going to speak on the government's intentions and maybe the, their decision-making processes. The one thing that they maybe haven't realized as much is compared to those days, 2008, 2009, the cost of the solutions have come down so significantly. So we're talking, you know, 80, 90 percent when we're talking uh, wind, solar and, and storage cost reductions since 2010. And so we're kind of in a different paradigm than we were back then. And these solutions are really available, good to go. They've been uh, delivering all across the, the world. And so the question with this new report um, that we're writing and the uh, that we've written and from uh, uh, the plan from the government is, you know, why are we looking at some of these things like nuclear and gas when renewables are now, you know, not just ready to go, but uh, dominating all across the world? Okay, David, I'm not going to ask you to speak on behalf of the government, but I will observe as a non-Ontario resident that you and I and the rest of the world understands the, the, the declines in costs for wind, solar, and battery. It beggars belief that the Ontario government doesn't quite, is still stuck in 2010. Nevertheless, it seems to be a mystery about, because you're not the only expert that's noted this, and that the, the government seems to be stuck in a... In a, in a uh, in a rut. Okay, so um, what are the plans? Give us some insight into the the nuclear sector because small, mo if I remember correctly, OPG is supposed to have its small modular reactor up and running by 2028, 2029. Yeah, so uh, that's the first of four. 
So basically, there's uh, there's one project, uh, Darlington, which uh, has four different reactors. And the first is coming online, I think it's by 2030. The date's kind of moved around a little bit. Um, with the the rest of the reactors coming along uh, online by around 2036. And, oh, sorry, and uh, but isn't Darlington a, a refurbishment? But the SMR is is uh, new, or have I misunderstood? So Darlington, um, I believe I'm stretching my knowledge a little bit here, but there, there's definitely some refurbishments that are happening, and that's actually driving that increase in gas use in power over the next kind of five to ten years. Uh, but the Darlington SMR project is uh, a new um, small modular reactor or four small modular reactors built on the existing uh, Darlington nuclear site. Oh, that's right. Uh, pardon me. I, I had forgotten about that. Um, okay. So the, um, the, the nuclear, what, uh, is there a percentage amount by which they're increasing uh, nuclear generation over the next, say, uh, 10 years? Or is sure. it so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So um, you know, this this the SMRs uh, at Darlington are really the first new nuclear plants truly that we've seen in many, many years. I mean, there's a big build out in 60s, 70s, um, 80s kind of time uh, in Ontario, but also, you know, across across the world, Western Europe as well. Um, and we haven't really seen that same kind of build um across the world since then. And so this is kind of one of the newest um uh, or, or one of the, yeah, it will be the, the, the newest nuclear plant, certainly in uh, in Canada, um, and, and the first new build in a while. Um, and we're talking about, you know, over the next 25 years, Ontario is targeting to build as much nuclear that it has today again. And so we're really talking about an enormous amount of um, uh, investment and also kind of reliance on uh, on nuclear over the next, yeah, 20, 25 years. What uh, now the uh, the uh, SMR at uh, or SMRs I guess the first one is uh, well under construction at uh, Darlington. Uh, any rumors as to or any insights into whether or not it's going to be finished on time and on budget? How does that look? Yeah, I mean um, everything that we've heard publicly says that you know it's going to be delivered in that way. But what we see looking across uh, the world, and and this is kind of gets into what we the analysis we did in our, our report is that over the last six years, the projects that have completed have on average completed six years late and double the cost. And, and when you're looking at projects that deliver a lot of energy and not necessarily super afford affordably, and then also delivering late and over budget, you know, that's, that starts to become a real concern around energy bills, uh, which we've already seen kind of recently in Ontario, some, uh, some reporting from the OEB um, around additional costs put on bills because of nuclear even existing now. And so to put that additional burden onto bill pairs is, you know, what we're saying in this report is that's a risky bet and it's uh, potentially going to increase people's bills. Oh, um, one of the things that I, I'm a little surprised about is uh, uh, you look at hydro provinces in particular. So uh, BC and Quebec come to mind where they are, you know, 98, 100% hydropower. And they've got, okay, this is great. We're going, to, we're going to enter into power purchase agreements with private independent contractors, a lot of them are First Nations, uh, to build out wind and solar and batteries, and, and we'll purchase that, uh, that power from them. And then we'll pair it with our, our you know, the, the basically the battery capacity from our hydro dams. And that works really well for us. So we think we can do that. We're seeing Manitoba maybe play with that idea a little bit more, but the hydro provinces are the most open to it. But I'm looking at Ontario's hydro uh, uh, power generation mix here, 55% nuclear, 24% electricity, 8% wind, 9% uh, solar and 4% solar and the rest of it would be would be natural gas and bioenergy. And I'm thinking that looks like a power mix that actually would pair pretty well with wind and solar and, and batteries. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, if you want the cheapest way of generating power and getting energy onto the system, then wind and solar is the way to do that, right? And the the thing that uh, we're also considering um, and, and talked about a little bit in this report is, you know, Ontario can look west to Manitoba, look kind of northeast to, to Quebec and see, you know, some pretty big batteries there too. And so when we're one of the things that we at Pemina are talking a lot about at the moment is interprovincial transmission. And so if we can get a bit more of an interconnected grid, 
um, and you know really kind of build some uh, better linkages between the provinces that can really unlock a lot of opportunities for ultimately sharing those resources that we as Canadians all um, uh, all have uh, and and you know manage the systems in a bit of an easier way. Let me tell you what this looks like from the outside. Uh, again, I was mentioning all the you know the the interviews that I do in various jurisdictions, and uh, what's plain to me is that there's a tremendous amount of innovation going on in the utility sector, which you normally was not in, that innovative. But now we're seeing oh things like virtual power plants and microgrids, and we're seeing AI integrated into the into the system and and uh, uh, ways to reconduct your transmission and on and on and on. I mean, there's a real technological revolution going on in, in grids around, around the world. And some of it's related directly to renewables and some of it is just technology change. And, and then I come back to Ontario and it looks like all they want to do is go, oh, okay, well, we've done nuclear for, you know, for decades. We're just going to do more of it. And then we're going to do some natural gas, which in a lot of ways just resembles nuclear. It's just a different way to heat up the water, to spin a turbine. And then we don't have to do all this fancy, you know, modernization of our grid. We can just go on and do what we've ever done. And if it's more expensive for consumers, well, well, say la vie, we're shrug. That's what it looks like from the outside. Because it doesn't look like there's a lot of innovation going on here. Am I right or am I, am I wrong? What do you think? There's there's definitely some innovation that's happening. I mean, um, Ontario is doing a lot of energy storage. So there's uh, both from a previous procurement, there's a bunch of stuff that's starting to get constructed. And, you know, lots of, you know, record size in terms of biggest projects in Canada and that kind of stuff. Um, and Ontario is also uh, delivering the biggest energy procurement and capacity uh, procurement in Canada. So they're definitely moving... Um, some ways in the right direction on some of these things, uh, as well as, you know, examining some interesting things about how do we deal with um, distribution companies, you know, they're, they're expanding a little bit on energy efficiency. So I do want to give the, uh, the Ontario government credit that they are exploring some of these issues, but ultimately exploring it and, you know, maybe doing a little bit here and there around the edges, it ultimately, it just comes back to what are they really investing in and where is the focus? Um, and it's very easy to, you know, touch on a lot of things. But ultimately, if, uh, as as you say, if the ultimate solution that they're uh, moving forward uh, with in, in order to meet the future energy needs and the growing energy needs uh, over the next 20 years, um, you know, that is nuclear. And, and so that's really kind of crowding out some of these other opportunities for innovation as well. Well, David, thank you very much for this. Um, we're going to come back because to this. I'm sure I'll be talking to you again. Because it, uh, when I look across Canada, there are a few provinces, and we mentioned Quebec and, and BC, that are somewhat innovative. Uh, but Canada as a whole is, is not very innovative on its power grid. And yet we have the federal government just passed the climate competitiveness strategy, which stresses the growth in the power grid and, and, uh, and innovation. And, and it's just there's some pieces here that don't fit. And I'll, I'll be looking forward to getting uh, your opinion on some of that in the, in the future. So thank you very much for this. Thank you for having me.